All right. Welcome. Okay. All right. Well, we welcome those that are here. We welcome those that are online and uh, to our prayer meeting this evening. We're going to be reading out of Christ Object Lessons, the chapter, first the blade, then the ear. So let's have prayer and then we'll get started. Father in heaven, we come to you tonight. Though we're small in numbers, we're big in heart, and we know that Christ is with us. We pray, Father, that you will please give us the knowledge that we need from this parable that was given, that we will see what Jesus was really talking about and how we can utilize that in our life today. Guide over us now as we do that is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. First the blade, then the ear. The parable of the sower, which we have just read, excited much questioning. Some of the hearers gathered from it that Christ was not to establish an earthly kingdom, and many were curious and perplexed. Seeing their perplexity, Christ used other illustrations, still seeking to turn their thoughts from the hope of a worldly kingdom to the work of God's grace in the soul. And he said, So is the kingdom of God, as if a man should cast seed into the ground, and should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow up. He knoweth not how. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he putteth in the sickle, because the harvest is come. The husbandman who putteth in the sickle because the harvest is come can be no other than Christ. It is he who at the last great day will reap the harvest of the earth. But the sower of the seeds represent those who labor in Christ's stead. The seed is said to spring and grow up. He knoweth not how. And this is not true of the Son of God. Christ does not sleep over his charge, but watches it day and night. He is not ignorant of how the seed grows. So we have another parable, another sower. This time, a little bit different story that Christ is telling. And as it says here, he's trying to get people to realize that this, is, this world is not where Christ's kingdom is. It's going to be formed, not right then. Okay, someone want to read? You want to read, Doc? You've got the mic. The parable of the seed reveals that God is at work in nature. The seed has in itself a germinating principle, a principle that God himself has implanted. Yet, if left to itself, the seed would have no power to spring up. Man has his part to act in promoting the growth of the grain. He must prepare and enrich the soil and cast in the seed. He must till the fields. But there is a point beyond which he can accomplish nothing. No strength or wisdom of man can bring forth from the seed the living plant. Let man put forth his efforts to the utmost limit. He must still depend upon one who has connected the sowing and the reaping by wonderful links of his own omnipotent power. There is life in the seed, there is power in the soil, but unless an infinite power is exercised day and night, the seed will yield no returns. The showers of rain must be sent to give moisture to the thirsty fields. The sun must impart heat Electricity must be conveyed to the buried seed. <clears throat> the life which the Creator has implanted, He alone can call forth. Every seed grows, every plant develops by the power of God. 
as the seed bringeth forth her bud, and as the garden causeth the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth. As in the natural, so in the spiritual sowing. The teacher of truth must seek to prepare the soil of the heart. He must sow the seed, but the power that alone can produce life is from God. There is a point beyond which human effort, effort is in vain. While we are to preach the word, we cannot impart the power that will quicken the soul and cause righteousness and praise to spring forth. In the preaching of the word, there must be the working of an agency beyond any human power. Only through the divine spirit will the word be living and powerful to renew the soul of, unto eternal life. This is what Christ tried to impress upon his disciples. He taught that it was nothing they possessed in themselves which would give success to their labors, but that it is the miracle working power of God which gives efficiency to his own word. You know, <clears throat> I usually like the sentences that have only <laughs> in it, where uh, Ellen White is pointing at a specific thing. And you'll notice right there in that last paragraph, it says, only through the divine spirit will the word be living and powerful to renew the soul unto eternal life. Without the Spirit, the Bible's nothing, is basically what it's saying to me anyway. Only with the Spirit is it going to renew your life and bring you, bring you into eternal life. Very interesting. I think also not just the Bible, but our witnessing. It says here preach, but I think we could easily substitute. <laughs> you gave it away. Not only reading the Bible or the Bible, but also, she says, while we are to preach, and, and I think we could substitute witness for preach there, that preaching, that witnessing without the Spirit will not have any effect. You know, I, I think, too, that we take witnessing too lightly. I really do because I think that it's much more important than we think because it shows, number one, how much we really love God. Amen. Because when you really love something, you'll tell everybody about it. And if you're not willing to tell people, do you really care? You know, so I think it's more, I think it's more powerful than what we let on. We think, oh yeah, we gotta go and witness but we do it because we got to go and witness, not because we love God. And I think that that needs to be the driving force behind um, that. So we can share something. If you really have that experience, you'll want to, to share it with others. And that's witnessing. And I think that's why God keeps saying you've got to go witness to the whole world, tell the whole world. It's not so much that we need to go tell as we need to, we need to show ourselves and others that we love God supremely. You know, you talk about witnessing and that, and if you really think about it, when something amazing happens in our life, Nobody can shut us up. And the most amazing thing, the song says, the, the song It Took a Miracle talks about hanging the worlds in space and that. But the greatest miracle is what Christ does in our heart. And when we've had that experience, we, we can't not share it. And I'm not saying that you'll never shut up. But how often we look at things and we have a worldly perspective. Oh, that was lucky. 
oh, boy, I'm glad that happened, instead of saying, God did this in my life. Why do we, why do sometimes things just don't go right when we're getting ready? We started at the right time, everything just, for whatever reason, the toothpaste tube was empty, so you had to get a new toothpaste tube. You went to get a shirt, and there was, uh, the shirts were in the ironing room, so you had to go get one there, and just different things. And now you end up not necessarily being late, but leave being later than you planned on it. Mm -hmm. Was that an accident, or was that God in your life? You know. Oh, I thought you were going to continue. It is, it's one of those things we don't know. But if you truly believe and pray that God's will will be done, I don't think it's an accident. No. I think that, that those things fall in place. Why do you get a flat tire? I remember a story that I read, and it, I don't even remember whether it was in a junior guide or one of the old this hour story. What were the story books back in our day? Um, the, the, your story hour? Yeah. I think it hour. is. Yeah. Bible stories. Bible stories, all those. But it was a story of a, uh, back in my era, when you didn't always have bridges over rivers, okay, and when you didn't always have tires that would go from point A to point B and back, that uh, I remember, I can remember a lot of times we stopped and changed tires just going from Orlando to Daytona Beach, which is not that far. <laughs> you know, it's 45 minutes on the freeway now, but it used to take a couple of hours the old days. But this story said this family was going to camp meeting, but they had to go, and at a certain point, they had to catch the ferry to go across the road because there was no bridge. And so everybody got in the car, they left on time, they were going along, and just as they were getting up at the top of the hill before they went down you know, the roads to get down to the river and the ferry, they had a flat tire. And here they are, and they're up there, and Dad's changing the tire as fast as he can when all of a sudden he heard the whistle and the boat was leaving, and they knew the boat only went one a day, once a day across the river. They were left. They were going to have to stay there and spend the night. They weren't going to get to camp meeting on time. And so it was very depressing. But they went ahead, changed the tire, and decided, well, we might as well have a picnic lunch because you usually took picnic lunches with you back in those days. It's different than it is now, Jessica. <laughs> uh, back in those days, you traveled when you went 50 miles. But... Uh, they were there eating their lunch when all of a sudden they heard an explosion. The boat caught fire and sank right in the middle of the river. Now they weren't so unimpressed with the fact that they had a flat tire right there where they could see it. You know? So sometimes God does things for us that we don't know. We get angry because it doesn't fit our schedule. I've got to be there. Do you really? You know, what's so important about life, you know, that you have to be someplace at some specific time? Only one place you have to be on time. That's in the right place when Christ comes. Amen. That's the only one that counts. And, and I think that's a, a good way to look at it is, am I on my schedule or am I on Christ's schedule? Because if I'm on Christ's schedule and he gives me a flat tire, then I'm right on schedule. You know, and I think so often we, um, I'm reading Acts of the Apostles right now and I'm almost to the end of Paul's life. And Acts of the Apostles says that it wasn't really God's will that he is preaching be cut short by the um, arrest and that from the religious leaders but God allowed it to happen. Um, I can't remember the exact wording, but basically to say that the religious rulers at the time wanted to silence him, and so God says, okay, you, you can do that, and other people would recognize the void that, that was created with it. So God's plan is not always just one plan, 
but he always has a plan, and wherever we are, we can witness. Um, Paul witnessed whether he was making tents or whether he was in front of Caesar. He shared his witness, and, and that's how we need to be at work, in Walmart, at the gas pump, wherever, because of the difference in us, people can see that and we can share that light, maybe without even mentioning God's name, but just by our interactions. Your words, your actions. Ellen White says that, you know, the way you react to things speaks more than a sermon. Yeah. And sometimes we don't take that into consideration either. You know, we think that, oh, I've got to come up and say, oh, Jessica, I want to tell you about Jesus. When you can tell by the way they act, the way they talk, the way they dress themselves, the way they do things. I mean, you know, one of those things. Yeah, there's, there's so much in there. I mean, today's lesson in the Sabbath school lesson <laughs> um, fits right in there because it's basically what happens when God doesn't quite do things the way you want them to be done, you know? Does God not care? You know? So I won't tell you the ending because I have to teach this week. <laughs> but it's, it's one of those things where, okay, I'll tell you. The, if you are so upset with God because you didn't get where you wanted to be, who's in control? You've taken control. You're selfish. You said, God, leave it alone. I got this one. I'll handle it. I know it's all screwed up here, but I can fix it. Instead of saying, hey, God, somehow this has all gotten messed up. I need help. Come and help me. And I'm turning it over to God to take care of. Because, you know, God has, God's ways are not our ways. <laughs> I mean, it's that simple. Very interesting. Well, we could talk all night. David? The work of the sower is a work of faith. The mystery of the germination and growth of the seed, he cannot understand. But he has confidence in the agencies by which God causes vegetation to flourish. In casting his seed into the ground, he is apparently throwing away the precious grain that might furnish bread for his family. But he is only giving up a present good for a larger return. He casts the seed away, expecting to gather it many fold in an abundant harvest. So Christ's servants are to labor, expecting a harvest from the seed they sow. The good seed may be for a time lie unnoticed in a cold, selfish, worldly heart, giving no evidence that it has taken root. But afterward, as the Spirit of God breathes on the soul, the hidden seed springs up and at last bears fruit to the glory of God. In our life, we're, we know not which will shall prosper, this or that. This is not a question for us to settle. We are to do our work and leave the results with God. In the morning sow the seed, thy seed, and in the evening withhold not thine hand. Ecclesiastes 11.6 God's great covenant declares that while the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest shall not cease. Genesis 8.22 In the confidence of this promise, the husbandman tills and sows. Not less confidently or we are we in the spiritual sower sowing to labor, trusting his assurance. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I send it. Isaiah 55:11. He that goeth forth and weepeth bearing 
precious seed and doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Very interesting. Very interesting. The work of the sower is the work of faith. There again, Sabbath school. <laughs> That's what this week's lesson is all about. Do you have faith in something you cannot see? Someone you cannot see. So, and it's the same way with the seed. You put it in the ground, you lose sight of it. Is it ever going to grow? Is it doing anything down there? And like it says, one ear of corn can give you many ears of corn. Which is it, even or odd? Do you know the number of rows of kernels? They're all the same. Whatever it is, they're all the same. Big ear, little ear. Because this story was told in Florida years ago, back in the 20s or 30s of the last century, that there was a prisoner that, you know, said, if I can find an ear of corn that has an odd number, whatever it's not supposed to be, will you let me out? And the warden goes, sure, because he knew they all had the same number. So he went out one day into the field and took one ear and opened it up and cut one out so that it would fill in. So the story goes. <laughs> God makes them all the same. And when you take one and you get all those little ones and you put them in the ground, you can have a vast harvest. And again, if you hold that corn and you don't share it with the ground, you don't sow that seed, how much do you get? One, One little teeny piece. Yeah. I also really like the part there where it said the good seed may for a time lie. Oops. The good seed may lie for a time unnoticed in a cold, selfish, worldly heart, giving no evidence that has taken root. But afterwards, as the Spirit of God breathes on the soul, the hidden seed springs up and at last bears fruit to the glory of God. It's a reminder that. Where our job is to just share the word. We may not necessarily be the reapers. We might be, just be the sowers. And we might not get to see the reaping of the harvest, but just share the word because we never know. Because, you know, that's, it's, the heart is describing your cold, selfish, worldly. This does not seem like somebody who would be receptive to the word of God, but you shared it, the spirit of God worked, and later it brought forth fruit. And did Jesus have that problem? Did Jesus sow seed that he, that he did not see yield fruit? Yeah. Because the spirit of prophecy says when the thousands, after the uh, Pentecost, when the thousands were brought into the church, those were people that had heard God, that had heard Christ. And they finally accepted. So Christ sowed the seed. He put it out there. But he didn't even see it in his own lifetime. And yes, I know he was resurrected, so it was in his lifetime. But he died there. In his preaching part, he did not see it finished. So don't be discouraged. It will come. Since you have the mic, go ahead. Where did we end up? The generation. The germination of the seed represents the beginning of the spiritual life, and the development of the plant is a beautiful figure of Christian growth. As in nature, so in grace. There can be no life without growth. The plant must either grow or die. As its growth is silent and imperceptible, but continuous, so is the development of the Christian life. At every stage of development, our life may be perfect, yet if God's purpose for us is fulfilled, there will be continual advancement. Sanctification is the work of a lifetime. As our opportunities multiply, our experience will enlarge and our knowledge increase. We shall become strong to bear responsibility and our maturity will be in proportion to our privileges. The plant grows by receiving that which God has provided to sustain its life. It sends down its roots into the earth. It drinks in the sunshine, the dew, and the rain. It receives the life-giving properties from the air. 
And so the Christian is to grow by cooperating with divine agencies. Feeling our helplessness, we are to improve all the opportunities granted us to gain a fuller experience. As the plant takes root in the soil, so we are to take deep root in Christ. As the plant receives the sunshine, the dew, and the rain, we are to open our hearts to the Holy Spirit. The work is to be done not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. If we keep our minds stayed upon Christ, he will come into us as the rain, as the latter and former rain unto the earth. As the sun of righteousness, he will arise upon us with healing in his wings. We shall grow as the lily. We shall receive as the co revive as the corn and grow as the vine. By constantly relying upon Christ as our personal Savior, we shall grow up into him in all things who is our head. Anything in there that anyone wants to talk about? You're okay. We, everybody's got one that needs it right now. Dave's the only one without one. I was just thinking, like, um, it's a very poignant statement what they, say, what they shared there. The plant that stops growing starts to die. And the same thing with the Christian. If you're, that's why it's not, you're not necessarily okay to just con, to be the same old, same old. There should always be growth. There should always be new things learned and deeper meaning gathered from the scripture. And it's not like, well, like, how, how to put it, like, my mom works as an OB nurse, and so sometimes I'll hear her talk about, you know, like, the stages of the baby and development. You know, once, once this has happened, you know, the baby has reached this stage. Once this has happened, the baby has reached that stage. And it's not quite like that for, this, for the Christian. There's no checklist out there of, well, you've become this level of a Christian once you read your Bible, once you've read your whole Bible, and you've become this level of Christian once you have devotionals for this long each day. There's no checklist. There's no set way of doing it because that's not how growth happens. That's not how relationships happen. It's just about spending the time and then patiently waiting for God to work. How many times have you planted a few um, seeds and they all grow at different rates? They'll come up differently. They'll grow taller differently depending upon what? Sunshine, water, soil, you know, lots of things, insects, <laughs> you know. But it is, you're right, it is that way with the Christian. Everybody, there's no checklist for salvation, for sanctification. Oh, I got that one down, only 18 more to go. No, it doesn't work that way. I think mean, you're exactly right with the development of a fetus or a child either one and to compare it to a Christian life even though Paul said when I was a child I spake as a child and he was referring to a spiritual life too <clears throat> but we don't have that same marked stepwise growth in the, in the Christian life but we do have constant growth just like a baby is constantly growing. Um, some of us may walk as a Christian and before we crawl, mm -hmm. uh, theoretically. Mm -hmm. So just because I don't understand justification by faith or the state of the dead doesn't mean I'm further along or not as far along in my Christian life, but we are still growing as a Christian or we're dying, exactly. Yeah, that's right, that's right. You're getting closer or further. One of the two. No, go ahead. You got the mic. <laughs> I was just going to add to it. And one of the things that I talk with my kids a lot, because sometimes it feels like, to, it really does feel sometimes like our church is Laodicea. We're here, we're the ten versions, and we're just sleepwalking through our Christian life. Mm -hmm. And I talk to the kids about, you know, like, you know, what do you, what do you need to do to be a Christian? Well, you know, we go through all of these motions. But it's something more than that. And I'll, I'm like, and it's also about, like, especially it's a personal time with Jesus. It's personal devotions, personal Bible study. You know, there I am in class, and I tell them, you know, it's not enough what you get with me in Bible class. 
It's not enough what you get from listening to the pastor's sermon every week on Saturday. Because if I'm taking the analogy, then that, that's baby food. You know, Paul said, you know, when I was a child, I spake as a child, a child, a child now I put away childish things. And then there is, isn't there another one about, he's talking about like the meat, how we need to be able to eat the meat. Mm -hmm. And by that he was meaning, we need to be able to eat adult food. And I was telling the kids, you know, how silly would it be if you see like a fully grown man sitting there at the table and his mom is still spoon feeding him. Gerbers. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, still spoon feeding him Gerbers. It would look ridiculous, and we would all laugh and say, ha, 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 that's so funny. And yet we do that too many times. People do that in their spiritual life. They're content to let everybody else chew up the spiritual food and give them the baby food. And we need to grow up. We need to have it for ourselves. And that is so true. I, you know, I felt that way with myself <laughs> for a long time because I was one, you know, like the kids, you know, I knew all the memory verses and I memorized all kinds of things. I knew all the answers for the questions, although I wouldn't always say them because I was shy. But um, hard to believe, I know, that I wouldn't talk. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the stuff that you know doesn't matter if you don't know him. And that was my problem. And when a push comes to shove, all the stuff I knew didn't help me stay in the church. I left because it wasn't about him. It was about what I knew. And I mean, you know, it's one of those things you look back on and you wonder as you look across the church, how many people are here because they really love God and they really want to get something. And how many people are here because they just want to feel good and say, yeah, God, I went to church today. I kept the Sabbath holy. I'm okay. Another week done, you know. Did they grow? Did they grow? How many people write down the verses that the preacher preaches and go back and read them again? You know, how many people really dive into the sermon, not just sits there and listen, going, uh huh, uh huh, uh huh, and then leaves and shakes his hand and says, Good sermon, and walks out and never thinks about it again. You know, what do we do? And how do you wake up Laodicea? How do you wake them up? And I know that's one where you could write a million books on that because everybody has their own idea, but in reality, I'm not. First, worried about Laodicea, but here. Because if you're not right, it doesn't matter what's happening to anybody else. You can't fix them if you're not right. So you're going to say something. Um, one thing you mentioned, uh, how do you wake up Laodicea? You don't. Laodicea has to want to wake up. Um, but it's amazing more and more how true the Bible is in life as well as spiritual things. But basically what we're talking about is the scripture having a form of godliness but denying the power of. How many of us have read about something that we've never been to or seen and perhaps dream about and plan and finally get to go there or experience it? And then is that experience better or disappointing is it you know if you do something that you like don't you want to repeat it and if we have that experience with Christ that we experience the experimental part of religion how do we not want to go back to it and repeat it whether it's in Ephesus or whether it's in Corinth, Corinth, Corinth or wherever, that's what kept Paul going is, I have this message to share, and once this group of people have it, then I want to go someplace else and start again. It wasn't that he just couldn't settle down, but he couldn't stop himself. Mm -hmm. This is so much fun, if that's the right word. This is so exciting, I can't calm down. 
and not everyone is going to be like Paul and have his missionary journeys, but all of us won't be able to calm down. We won't be able to sit back and say, okay, I, I've had enough. That's very true, very true. But yeah, there's, uh, there's so much. Read of text in the Bible. Most of us, if it's a familiar text, we know it so well, we just read it. We don't read it. We don't study it. We read it. We know the words because we've memorized them, but you don't think of what those words mean. And stop. Take a time to read a word and think about it and then read the next word and think about it. God is trying to talk to you. And God says, be still and know that I'm God. Then say, read it through real fast and say, okay, I read a chapter of the Bible. I've done my, done my duty for the day. Check that one off, okay? No, it says study the Bible, not read the Bible. I don't think there's any place where it says read the Bible. It always says study the Bible. Search. Yeah, search the scriptures. Yeah, it's always that way. And so many of us don't do that. And I say us as a collective church, you know, how many people actually open their Bible when the preacher stands up there and says, open it to Genesis 5, okay? How many actually do that? You know, and I'm not getting Genesis on people. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, where do I find that? <laughs> You're right. So it's one of those things where you have to look at it first for yourself, but then how can I help the church before I even go outside? You know, because we need to have a revival right in here before we have a revival of the people out there and bring them in to a church that's sitting, you know, on their thumbs going, okay, I'm okay, I'm okay. You know, it's so interesting when you talk about witnessing in that. Two of the examples in the gospel of witnessing are people that had no business witnessing from our standpoint. The woman at the well, she was not a Jew, and she had spent, I don't know, an hour, 30 minutes, five minutes, whatever, with Christ. She hadn't gone to Andrews University or Southern or whatever. She hadn't gone to Camp Asabo for a weekend retreat, and then the one or two demoniacs, they had no training, they had no longevity in the church, but that contact with Christ, they couldn't help but share. The woman at the well went back and, and disregarded her, um, what do you call it, past, her dark past or whatever, what she didn't want anybody to know. But she told people, this person told me about the things I did. Mm -hmm. She was so excited about the change he had put in her life. And so again, as we witness, we can only share what God has done for us. And we will share what God has done for us. If we share nothing, then God has done nothing for us. Yeah, that's true. You know, and, and, and I know sometimes it takes some courage, but God will give you that courage. It's amazing. We'll tell somebody to watch out for that mud puddle that their shoes may get a little muddy, but we won't tell them about eternal death. We won't tell them about a heaven to gain and a hell to shun because we don't want to offend them. You know, and, and I'm not saying this is other people, but I have become much more bold. Um, mm -hmm. You have you know, to. Yeah. You have to. And, you know, the scripture says... I am not ashamed of the gospel. Hmm, those are tough words. You know, I am not ashamed of the gospel. How many can walk out of here and witness to somebody? You know, you say, hey, it's time to witness. Oh, I'm busy today. My clothes are dirty. My shoes, my feet hurt. I was up late last night. I've got to go. I mean, we've got a thousand things. Is that the real reason, or is it because you're ashamed? You don't want people to know you're a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. I'm ashamed. Uh, 
there's a lot there. This, this one story has a lot of stuff. Take your pick. The wheat develops first the blade, then the ear. After that, the full corn in the ear. The object of the husbandman in the sowing of the seed and the culture of the growing plant is the production of grain. He desires bread for the hungry and the seed for the future harvest. So the divine husbandman looks for a harvest as the reward of his labor and sacrifice. Christ is seeking to reproduce himself in the hearts of men, and he does this through those who believe in him. The object of the Christian life is the fruit bearing, the reproduction of Christ's character in the believer, that it may be reproduced in others. The plant does not germinate, grow, and bring forth fruit for itself, but for to give seed to the sower and bread for the eater. So no man is to live unto himself. The Christian is in the world as the representative of Christ for the salvation of others, other souls. There can be no growth or fruitfulness in the life that is centered in self. If you have accepted Christ as, the, as a personal savior, you are to forget yourself and to try to help others. Talk of the love of Christ, tell of his goodness, do every duty that presents itself, carry the burden of souls upon your heart, and by every means in your power, Seek to save the lost. As you receive the spirit of Christ, the spirit of unselfish love and labor for others, you will grow and bring forth fruit. The graces of the spirit will ripen in your character. Your faith will increase. Your convictions deepen. Your love be made perfect. More and more you will reflect the likeness of Christ in all that is pure, noble, and lovely. There were several good things in there. You know, there can be no growth or fruitfulness in the life that is centered in self. There were just several things in there, you know. Christ is seeking to reproduce himself in the hearts of men. And he does this through those who believe in him. The object of the Christian life is fruit bearing. To reap the reproduction of Christ's character in the believer first. Then that it may be reproduced in others. Paula, you want to finish? Sure. The fruit of the Spirit is love, <clears throat> joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. This fruit can never perish, but will produce after its kind a harvest unto eternal life. When the fruit is brought forth, <clears throat> immediately he putteth in the sickle, because the harvest is come. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly re reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. It is the privilege of every Christian not only to look for, but to hasten the coming of the Lord Jesus. Were all who profess his name bearing fruit to his glory, how quickly the whole world would be sown with the seed of the, of the gospel. Quickly, a last great harvest would be ripened and Christ would come to gather the precious grain. How quickly. You know, the fruit of the Spirit, there's nine of them. Nine fruits. 
the first three, love, joy, and peace, are what we get from God. That's our relationship to God. He gives us love. God is love. How can you have peace? By knowing him and trusting him. And joy. Joy comes from God. The next three, uh, gentle, long-suffering, gentleness, and goodness is what we give to other people. It's how do you relate to other people? Are you long-suffering to others? Are you gentle with them? Do you show goodness to them? And the last three are for us. Faith. We have to have faith. We have to have meekness. And we have to have temperance. The fruits are there. And they're there for us and God, for us and the others, and for us ourselves. But once we get the fruits, then we have to reproduce that. We have to share it. Is it fruits or is it fruit? It's fruit. The fruit of the Spirit. So that one fruit includes all of them. I can't have the fruit of love and joy and you of meekness and long-suffering. You can have it, but not in... No, you're going to have it either from God or give to other people right. or have it in your own heart. You'll have the whole thing. You, you have won't to have do, the right. whole thing. Exactly. Yeah. When you get done, you have to have the whole thing. It's not a, not a part-time thing. Oh, I don't like strawberries, so I'm not going to have that fruit. I was just thinking, I was disagreeing with how you're putting them a little bit. I think that all of them fit into all the categories. Because the goodness we receive from God, you know, that's how he changes us. He gives us his goodness. The faith we also receive from God. The temperance we receive from God. So we're able to have that self-control in our lives. I think all of them are really that way. And then all of them also are for, like, our betterment as well. But then all of them are also meant to be shared. We have this uh, joy in Jesus, and then we also share that with others. We have a peace in Jesus, and we share that with others too. So I, I don't yeah. know. I just think they, they all, all yeah. nine can fit into all three categories. And they can. I'm just telling you my little take on it. <laughs> okay. Any comments on this last word at the end of that and tears for next week? Um, any comments on what we have, what we've read? First the blade, then the ear. Why did Christ tell this parable? See, it's in school now. You got to know the answer. <laughs> huh? If we don't keep up in the word of God, then we don't stray away. We have to uh, be uh, down to deep into his word and, and keep faith in him. Otherwise, we're going to be just like those that are on a rock and just have shallow words. So we have to want to learn more. Love yeah. Love I think it's also to give us encouragement in our own Christian walk because it's, you know, first the blade and then the ear. Don't expect to be a full blown corn plant right away. It's going to be a growth process. And then also to give us encouragement when we're sharing with others because we're not always going to see immediate results. Yep. In the very first paragraph, it says, still seeking to turn their thoughts from the hope of a worldly kingdom to the work of God's grace in the soul. Then the next paragraph starts out, and he said. And he said. You're right. So his main one was to get them focused right, but he also wanted to show us other things along the way. All right. Any prayer requests tonight? For our granddaughter Addison, she's going to be having a procedure on her foot on Friday. Okay. So we pray that that goes well and she's yep. not in too much pain. And, <laughs> and we all got good. Arlene's message today, yes. which has changed. But Arlene is still going to have the, this surgery done, but it's just not going to be Friday. It's date unknown at okay. this point. So, so that's going to happen. And have surgery. Anybody else? Yeah. Carolyn. Yeah. I haven't heard anything as to what 
has changed or not changed, but I keep praying. That's all we can do. Yep. Elliot's other grandpa, Vinny, with prostate cancer. Mm. Mm. Cancer seems to be one of those things you don't hear about, and then all of a sudden you hear everybody's got it, and then it goes away again, and then all of a sudden everybody you know has it. And, yeah, it's one of those things you only can pray for in many cases. God can work miracles, and that's, again, back to the Sabbath school lesson, okay? Faith. Do you actually believe God can heal somebody today? I mean, he did in Christ's day, he did in Peter's day, he did in Paul's day. Can he actually do it today? Do you have that much faith? Yeah. I mean, it's easy to say, but it's sometimes hard to believe. God and then we... More people than I do. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, that's for, for Sabbath when we have Sabbath school. <laughs> All right. Well, let's have prayer. Do you want to pray tonight? Okay, and then we'll come across and work our way back to the front. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful day you have blessed us with, for um, just loving us, Lord, and having patience with us, Lord. And Thank you for um, all the children that are going to school this year, Lord. Please help our school to grow. Help the children to learn everything they can about you, Lord, to draw nearer to you, Lord. Please be with David, Lord, and help him find, find a place. And um, be with Carolyn and, and with Addison and um, with um, Alan's grandson's other, other grandpa. And, Lord, just be with us and help us to walk with you, Lord, each and every day to draw closer to you. In the most holy name I pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so thankful that you don't ever give up on us. <clears throat> We're so thankful that you want to impart your character into our hearts, Lord, your spirit into us, Lord. I pray that you would um, do just that. I pray that you would help us to be willing recipients. And I pray that you would Bless those who are sick and who need healing, especially I'm thinking of little Addison. I pray that you would bless her this week as she has her procedure done. And please be with Carolyn, Lord, and give her strength and courage and help her, Lord, to also um, keep her positive outlook on life and the, 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 what she's going through. And I um, also want to pray for Rachel Fennell, who also has breast cancer. I pray, Lord, that you would be able to heal her. She's a young woman. I mean, she's got grown children, but I consider her younger. And I just pray that you would bring healing to her, Lord, and strengthen her family also and as they care for her. And um, I just thank you for your, your wonderfulness, your goodness, and your love. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Mm -hmm. Father in heaven, we thank you for your many blessings and for your love for us. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for your spirit. And we ask that you would send your spirit to work on our hearts and help us to be effective witnesses to those around us of your love. And help us to be kind and loving and a blessing to those around us. We ask that you be with those that need healing. We think of Carolyn Pekarik and Amber Butcher mm -hmm. and also... Um, Rachel Fennell and, and Addison. And in each case, Lord, I, you are the great physician. I pray that you would work your perfect will in each case. And uh, please bless her school, the teachers, and students. And we thank you for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening thanking you for all that you have done for us. Bless us in a special way. Keep us in your care. Help us do your will and forgive us our sins. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Dear kind and loving Heavenly Father, you have an infinite watch care over each one of us. 
to tenderly and gently guide us in the path that you've prepared for us to draw us closer to you. Not necessarily a path of life and ease and pleasure here on this earth, but a path that prepares us for that perfect life and eternity with you. Open our hearts and our minds to see and accept the teachings, the messages that you're trying to share with us today. Just like we look back at the disciples and the time when Christ was here at first, how they didn't understand his message and they were stuck in their traditions and the thoughts that they had of Christ coming. Don't let us follow that same path, Lord. Mm -hmm. We pray that we will understand the message you have prepared for us tonight. Please be with those that are in need of physical healing, Carolyn, Addison, Vinny, Rachel, and the others. You are truly the master physician. We pray that you will heal them as you see fit and bring them a comfort and a peace. Most importantly, that they will submit to your wisdom and your plan for their life. That wherever they are, they may claim you as their master physician and their comforter and trust in you and be a witness perhaps to physicians and nurses and others that are caring for them. Be with us, Lord, that we may accept your seed in our heart and that we may share that seed and till that soil in other hearts. That we may be patient and gentle husbandmen, um, nurturing your vineyard, Lord. Bless and guide us in this day, we pray. If it be thy will, in thy name, amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for your blessings. I thank you that our first week of school has gone well. Thank you for the children that you have brought to us this year. Lord, I want to ask that you will continue to work on the hearts of these kids. Each and every day we tell them about you. We share your word with them. Lord, we are planting seed, so we pray that the Holy Spirit will be there to water and bring forth the harvest. I pray that you will continue to work on their hearts and to help them to be drawn closer to you. I would like to ask also that you will please be with um, Mrs. Pekarik, that you will give her healing. I want to ask that she will be with those who are having procedures, with um, Addison and also um, with Arlene. Please also be with Elliot's grandpa, and I pray for healing for him as well. And please also be with David. Thank you, Lord, that we can cast our cares on you. Thank you for how much you care for us, for how you take care of us, and for how much you love us. Thank you, Lord, that we have guidance in your word and in the spirit of prophecy. I pray that we can share this with others so that they can have the fruits of the Spirit in their life as well. In your name, amen. amen. Father in heaven, we come to you tonight thanking you for being here with us. We thank you, Father, for the words that we've been able to read tonight, the words that Christ gave 2,000 years ago talking about what we should be doing, spreading those seeds, not worrying about the germination, but spreading the seeds, and how we need to have the seeds, the fruits of the Spirit in, in, in our life. We need to work with others. We need to prepare ourselves for the soon coming of Christ. Father, we pray that you will help us to take these words to heart as we've read them tonight. You've heard all the prayer requests that have been given tonight. Please, Father, as your will dictates, answer those prayers. Take care of these people. Guide over each one of them in the crucible that they're in right now. Help them to come closer to you because of the experience that they're going through. And if at all possible, Father, we pray that you will remove whatever disease or bother they have from them. We pray for the school. It started now. Be with the kids. Help the kids to see Christ while they're there. Help them to remember they're there for a special reason, not just to learn arithmetic, but to learn arithmetic and and adding others to the church. 
We pray, Father, that you will be with each one of us now as we travel home. Keep us safe. Bring us back Sabbath so that we can once again worship you in your house. Thank you for hearing us tonight is my prayer in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Thank you all very much.